All right. Welcome everyone to Faith Commons. This is the state of our faith, our third conversation together during the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And we are starting again at 1212 as we have been each of the past three weeks uh, on Sundays. Uh, this is sort of an update, uh, a, a, a briefing, uh, you, if you will, spiritually. Uh, I'm pleased once again to be joined by my colleagues and friends. Uh, this is Rabbi Nancy Kasten and uh, Imam Omar Solomon, and we are Faith Commons. I'm George Mason, uh, pastor of Wilshire Baptist Church and president of Faith Commons. Today, we're gonna to be talking about loving your neighbor as yourself during a pandemic. And uh, we are gonna be looking at that theme in various ways, but it would probably be important for us to start out by just reminding us where we are globally and nationally and locally with this terrible virus that is uh, taking more lives projected uh, then all the wars since the Korean conflict, including Vietnam and uh, Afghanistan and Iraq and uh, all of these wars combined, we have the potential of losing that many lives uh, during this time. So far, uh, globally, there are 1.2 million cases of COVID-19 with 66,000 deaths <coughs> in the US, we have 300,000 cases and 8.4, well, 8,400 8, deaths. In Dallas County, 1,000 cases, more than 1,000 cases now with 18 deaths as of this morning. This is a dark and difficult time. But in all of our religious traditions, we know what it's like to deal with darkness and disappointment uh, with griefs, and I'd like us just maybe as we begin spiritually today to go around and back and forth and naming some of these griefs. What are some of the griefs that we are all experiencing spiritually right now? Well, I guess I'll start. <laughs> um, you know, from, from, from my perspective, I think that the grief um, is that some of the people that I was expecting to be in the mosque when we get back to the mosque might not be there. And thinking about that, uh, this Friday, um, someone in my old community of New Orleans, which has been hit very hard, um, you know, Uncle Abdul Jabbar is what we called him. He was in the mosque every every prayer. When I say every prayer, I mean all five prayers of the day when I was the imam of that mosque. And he would even do his, uh, his workouts um you know between between the the, the the mosque walls as he was waiting uh for the next prayer i mean he was a fixture in that mosque and uh when i heard that he passed away on friday um <clears throat> and that they they buried him yesterday in new orleans uh it just it, it it really dawned upon me that as we keep talking about when our mosque doors reopen um, that there's a possibility that, that some of the people that were the fixtures in those mosques are not going to be there anymore. And so that, that hit me really hard, um, you know, knowing that. And um, while, you know, I pray for, for him and his family, they're very beloved to me, and some of the other people that have been hit by this, um, I think that we need, to, we need to sort of reorient ourselves to where we're thinking about our purpose in life. And while we're thinking about our purpose in life, that doesn't just mean the individual, but the institution. Uh, sort of how we have to go back and revisit why we were brought here in the first place. We have to ask ourselves why our institution's doors were open in the first place before we reopen them and revisit those purposes and revisit those missions and, uh, and dig deep and, and have those moments of reflection as to what we're gonna do uh, better that's going to reflect our our mission and purpose in a way that that caters to everyone in the community and that that really fulfills people um, in these moments. So grief uh, is is definitely in the air, but you know we we're obviously having to keep the hope. But in you know in, in full vulnerability, um, <clears throat> it's hard when you're hearing about people that you're so used to being around you, 
um, that are associated with your place of worship. You know, uh, Ankh Abdul-Jabbar was, uh, when I think of my old mosque in New Orleans, uh, he is the first of two people that come up, you know, in my mind. And so thinking about going back there and, and, and uh, even though I don't go to that mosque anymore, but thinking about attending my mosque period and not having the same people there uh, is a very difficult thought. And so what do we do differently um, when our doors reopen? And we have to be thinking about that from now. How do we, how do we do, how do we act differently and in accordance with a greater purpose uh, when our mosque doors reopen? Nancy? Well, you know, of course, there's a concern for loss, primary concern for loss of life. And at the same time, I guess some of my grief is about our lack as a human species of learning from our mistakes. And that, you know, as much as we all truly want to see a world in which people will be able to be comforted and supported and maintain their health in times of um, challenge as well as times of ease, we don't do a good job of that. And, um, you know, I, I, I really have such concern for the millions of people who aren't going to be able to continue to pay their rent and to continue to buy food and also pay for transportation to get to their job and get the medication that they need. These are not new problems, but they come in stark relief right now um, against the backdrop of a disease that's affecting all of us equally, um, not equally, but it, it threatens all of us and um, we're all concerned about it. And why aren't we all concerned about all those other pandemics. That's, I guess that's my sense of real grief. Well, thank you. I, I think that one of the worst um, consequences of this is that it tends to throw into doubt our own faith experiences for some people. Uh, during times like this, our disappointment with the world and our experience of it can also lead to a disappointment with God. And uh, while that may be uh, something we would like to avoid, in some ways it might actually be something that leads us to a deeper experience of God and of faith. Uh, this is Holy Week uh, beginning today, Palm Sunday for Christians, and we know that it's an interesting time for us to learn spiritually about what we do with our disillusionment, uh, our sense of expectations that are not realized, uh, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, uh, there were all sorts of uh, remembrances and allusions to Judas Maccabeus and to uh, the, the, the conquering um, presence of the one who would uh, liberate the people from captivity, in this case, the Romans. And before the week was out instead, <laughs> what happened is uh, that what we, what we got was uh, his betrayal and death on a cross. And there was a sense of really a, a great loss, a, a feeling that uh, confidence in God was, was being shattered. Uh, even Jesus uh, in his words on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting uh, the Psalm of, of David. And, and yet uh, in that darkness, uh, light appears and we know that Easter is coming and there is deliverance after all. I, I think what we need to learn is that in our uh, experience of disillusionment, what's really being lost is our expectations, not what God wants to give us, but we have to adjust uh, to what is really taking place and what God is up to. And it may be better than we ever expected because we learn that the worst thing is not the last thing in any of our faiths. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when, when I'm thinking about disillusionment and, and the way that people are feeling in regards to their faith experience, and obviously um, the need to reconnect with supplication and solitude and, and, and all that comes with, with being alone with God uh, in your room as, as you're uh, being hit with 
uncertainty as well as vulnerability and not having the people around you to hug you, then you only have God's embrace to rush to. And as you turn to God, uh, one of the things that I think that people um, are, are really going to have to come to terms with, and it's it's we have to come to terms with this as a society, and then people have to come to terms with this as individuals, is you know, the, the lack of financial stability offers a, a very unique faith challenge. Um, it, it can bear a sense of resentment, a sense of, uh, you know, a sense of deficiency on the part of the person who, who's not able to pay their bills, who's not able to, uh, to, to take care of their basic needs. And uh, what, I, what I see is that, you know, in my community, there are people that are more afraid of the financial uh, insecurity and instability than they are of uh, catching COVID-19 and dying, right? I mean, it's the, the idea of not being able to live in a dignified way um, and, and, uh, and, and overcome poverty in their own lives actually scares them uh, more than catching the virus and being in a hospital on a ventilator and passing away. And so uh, the challenge for us as society is to, is to work against those inequities, uh, to, to fight against poverty. You know, the, the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, spoke about poverty as an enemy. Uh, we supplicate against it and we, and we work against it and uh, we challenge it and we fight it. And so um, I think that when we're talking about the unique faith challenges that people have, it may just be a means of, as, as, as you're telling that individual to reconnect to God and to, and to try to see not the wisdom in it, because I think that's where we go wrong is when we tell people or we try to theorize what God's wisdom is in this. And that's actually a problem. Uh, instead of trying to theorize and trying to come to terms with what is God's wisdom and trying to bring in eight pieces to the puzzle that that person might not have considered. Instead, God has the full view. And yes, it is a struggle. And we should acknowledge that anxiety that comes with not having the full view yourself. But placing your trust in God uh, means doing your best part. It also means society does their best, that all of us do our best, that those of us that don't have that particularly unique vulnerability work in accordance with, uh, with that challenge for our brother or sister and try to uplift them. Well, Omar mentioned that we also do our best on behalf of others. And Nancy, you had a piece that was published this week, an op-ed piece in the Dallas Morning News that made that very point, that mm -hmm. loving your neighbor as yourself during this period requires that individuals and also communities of faith really discipline themselves about their social distancing uh, because uh, rather than claiming our rights, we need to do what is right by our neighbor too. Would you say a few words about, about that piece? And people can find it, by the way, online at faithcommons.org. But uh, go on and, and, and describe what you were uh, saying in that piece, Nancy, would you? Well, um, I have to say that an old joke comes to mind. I'm going to tell the New Orleans version of it on, uh, in, in deference to, to Omar. Um, so, you know, Katrina's happening, the flood waters are rising, and a woman goes up to the top of her house on the roof and she starts praying to God to save her. And a guy comes by in a rowboat and she says, no, no, I'm praying to God, God will save me. And then the Coast Guard comes by and the Coast Guard says, can we help you? And she let us take you to safety. And she says, no, God is gonna save me. I'm praying God is gonna save me. And then they send a helicopter in to try to airlift her out. And she says, no, I'm sure God is gonna save me. And so, of course, she drowns, goes to heaven, and she says to God, God, I was praying for you to, to save me. And he said, well, didn't, and God says, well, what do you think the rowboat and the Coast Guard and the airlift was all about? I was listening to your prayers. So the idea that we are, that prayer in and of itself without um, the engagement and the utility of the um the tools that we have the resources that we have that are created by humans out of god's creation the human beings that god has inspired with life and creativity to help one another to think that you know this is something that that is only for the spiritual realm and not at all um the responsibility of other human beings is 
not what our faith really dictates, at least not mine, I don't think either of yours. And so, you know, the piece that I wrote really spoke about that, that, you know, to say that I know better as a faith leader than um, the public health experts about what's going to save my community or what's gonna save even my own life um, is, it, there's a lack of humility in that that is actually um, idolatry. And right. so we, so I, I think, you know, we need to really take seriously our role as God's partners in this world and in bringing healing into the world, whoever we are, whatever we do, we have that obligation. And, you know, um, the message of Passover is a message of radical empathy and compassion, right? We're supposed to remember that we were slaves in Egypt. We're actually supposed to feel that suffering. And I think at this time in our city and county and state and national um, history, when we are all experiencing fear of the same thing, which doesn't happen that often, this is a, a great example of how we are all one and we all suffer and while our suffering may look different at different times, ultimately it's all the same and we need to help alleviate, alleviate that suffering however we may. One of the things that we are all dealing with as faith leaders is the fact that the medical community is going to be reaching its limits very soon, uh, both in the hospitals and with uh, the medical technology that is available to them. We had published in that same edition that Nancy, your post uh, came out, uh, was a <clears throat> column by several doctors who were part of the North Texas Mass Critical Care Guidelines for Adults and Pediatrics. Uh, this, uh, th these guidelines were uh, prescient in that they were formed uh, many years ago uh, and, and they were published now again to help guide the decisions of medical professionals in terms of how to allocate care. And there are two really critical things about it. Uh, the, the, uh, the first is that uh, access or um, uh, denial will not be based upon uh, any criteria, but that the most number of lives will be uh, preserved uh, as, as possible, but that instead of subjective criteria, there will be objective criteria applied if there are going to be decisions that have to be made. That's called SOFA, and I'll uh, tell you the, um, the acronym means, um, if I can get it, it's Sequential um, Organ Failure Assessment Score, the Sequential Organ Failure Assessment Score, which is a scientific way of determining the probability of someone's survivability. And so uh, these have been published. Uh, and, and Nancy, you have written a clergy letter uh, to, on, on behalf of Faith Commons to help clergy and faith leaders uh, know how to talk to their congregations and healthcare professionals about this also and disseminate this information. Again, that is online at faithcommons.org. Uh, but uh, say a few words about how all of this came to be, Nancy, if you will. And then Omar, I'd like for you to follow up with uh, one of the uh, unforeseen things about this is that everybody doesn't start out at the same place in health. Freddie Haynes, Reverend Freddie Haynes published a piece also that talked about the greater vulnerability of the African-American community in this. And so I'd like to turn to you after that. Nancy, introduce this a little more and then Omar, if you would uh, comment on it. Well, I um, was asked to be part of a working group that would revisit these guidelines, which were developed about 10 years ago, and, um, and help to explain them to the various people who would be affected by them uh, by, in this particular situation of the coronavirus. Um, as a result, I started thinking about what do faith leaders really need to hear about these guidelines. Obviously, 
we all want to save as many lives as we can. Nobody wants to feel that's, that one person's life was worth less than another's. At the same time, the reality is, you know, while God's abundance is manifest, that there are certain resources that are limited. And the question is how best to use those resources. Given the current situation of our society and our healthcare system and our communal health, uh, these guidelines do the best job possible to create equity if there are medical resources that need to be rationed. And if only certain, if there aren't enough for everybody, that includes skilled medical professionals and particularly ICU beds and ventilators. But my point in the um, article is that by not doing everything possible to um, flatten the curve of this virus so that the most people possible can benefit from the resources that are available, that we are contributing to pain and suffering and we are not acting in God's interests or in our faith or according to our faith convictions. That to, um, to say that, there, that we're going to continue to offer the same spiritual support that we offered before because our people need it or because that's really what's going to save us is again, not using the resources that God has provided for us to act responsibly and to do our best to make these hard decisions as infrequent as possible. Yeah, and I think that, you know, to, to Pastor Haynes' point and, and to what's being said here, and I tie it all in, you know, the, the, the burden that's placed on minorities in terms of patriotism to give back to society and to do and to feel like they have to do more to be treated equitably is not met by the burden to prove their humanity when they walk into a hospital and when they walk into an urgent care clinic in the way that they're just so used to being treated. And so our healthcare system is definitely not colorblind. Our healthcare system definitely has embedded uh, you know, issues that discriminate against people in poverty and discriminate particularly against people of color in poverty. And um, <clears throat> you can't you can't suddenly undo all of the baggage of uh, the, the the present climate of xenophobia. When when a black Muslim woman walks in with a veil into a hospital, uh, is she going to be treated the same way? Uh, is she going to be told to go home at some point? Uh, and I just gave that one example, right? Because it's actually something that. <laughs> um, I was, uh, I, I became acquainted with a very, you know, a personal situation um, in my community. And so um, we have to obviously rid ourselves of those inequities and do as best as we can to get, uh, to get it all right on paper. But unfortunately, I think what we often see is that what's on paper does not translate into real life interactions. And those subtle, uh, those subtle interactions that make the human interaction so beautiful when they're enriched by faith and by some of the values that come through faith, um, unfortunately, can can also be uh, on the flip side very ugly and um, and and indeed feed discriminatory policy as well. So I think that we need to obviously do away with that. And I do want to just stay um, on that note. And, and I hope it's okay to jump back just a little bit on on how the faith community needs to think about those around. I, I think that often those same those same faith communities that were not that were not willing to close the doors of their church. And if you listen to, or whatever place of worship it is, and particularly some of the wealthier ones, right? If you, if you were to watch a video of the kids on a Florida beach in spring break talking about how they're not gonna give up something that's important to them uh, because of anyone else. Uh, if you were to take those same words and you were to listen to the words of some of those wealthier places of worship in particular, I think what you'll see is that there's a, a deeper problem uh, of, of the love of the neighbor, which is just the ignorance of the neighbor and the complete neglect of the neighbor. And I didn't care about the neighbor before the pandemic. Why should I care about my neighbor now? And I think on the other side of that, we have to, we have to highlight some of the good examples that are coming from the faith communities that are leading the way right now. And, and I do want to just share one of those, which is, um, you know, because I said there's a burden that minorities feel sometimes in particular to prove their worth to society. And unfortunately, they also have the burden of proving their humanity when they walk into those facilities. Um, there's, there's a very beautiful man in, in my community who 
um, has opened his uh, produce stores to all the charity organizations. He said, take the best of what I have, because that's what that's what God loves when you sacrifice what's best. So take what's most scarce with the people right now and fill up your boxes and go deliver them. And he's also donating um, 5,000 uh, full face shields to four hospitals in Dallas. And, and he just feels called to do something like that. And I, and, and I said, you know, that's faith right there. That's faith in action. And I think we need to also highlight the good examples of, of the faith communities of some of the faith leaders like yourself, Nancy, and, and, and Dr. Haynes and others that are advocating uh, for public health and that are, and then some of the, the, the people within our communities that are really leading the way organizationally or individually uh, to help those that are at the, uh, unfortunately, that are dealing with these inequities, even when they themselves are dealing with these inequities. So we need to highlight those examples as well, uh, you know, and let, the, let those sort of lead us uh, forward. So I think as we come toward the close of our time together today, it's important to understand that when we use language in our faith communities about these moments being apocalyptic, we don't just mean that they are um, ushering in the end of days. What we mean is the literal meaning of apocalyptic, which is a kind of unveiling, a revealing of the way things actually have been beneath the surface of things, beneath our gaze. And so we're able to see things more clearly, both the bad and the good, as you said, Omar, I think. And, and, and as faith leaders, it's up to us to be able to put the spotlight on both of those things at the same time. And that's what we try to do at Faith Commons is recognize that there are longstanding inequities and disparities of injustice that exist in our society that we are beginning to see more clearly now during this a difficult time, but there are also extraordinary examples of everyday kindness and generosity that are being uh, shown to us uh, as we are called to our better selves. And so we're looking for those moments too, uh, as a way of uh, giving people a picture through Faith Commons of uh, this world that we think God has dreamed of and that we want to live into together. Uh, again, I want to remind everyone that there's a lot more information on uh, faithcommons.org, our website, and we want to invite you to go there and find all these articles that we've talked about. The clergy letter is available to you there as well, and we invite clergy faith leaders to take that and to use it with their congregations and people who are making key decisions during these times. Uh, it will be useful to you, I think, as a resource. Omar, uh, Nancy and, and the Jewish community are uh, leaning into Passover this week. Uh, the, the Christian community that I serve and others uh, are entering into Holy Week even now. These are difficult times. And I wonder if I could ask you to offer a brief prayer uh, for us during uh, these times as we conclude together. Sure. <clears throat> Uh, in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful, we ask you to send your peace and blessings upon your prophets and messengers, and we ask you to descend upon us guidance and tranquility and peace. We ask you that just as our faith communities, when they are physically together, have to worry for their safety and have to worry about being attacked in these unprecedented times, we ask you that in this particular unprecedented time, as our faith communities are now uh, connected with one another virtually, we ask you to protect them from all of the things that harm them that are as unseen as the things that, uh, that, that plague us physically. We ask you to protect them from loneliness and, and hardship and uh, the feeling of being unloved. We ask you to activate us to be a source of shelter, just as we gather together around places of worship to link arms to protect places of worship from being attacked by those that wish them harm. We ask you that in this time where everyone is afraid and, and people are vulnerable and scared, we ask you to descend peace and tranquility and togetherness and to allow us to be a part of that togetherness. And while we can't link arms physically around one another, we ask you to allow us to do so with the mercy that you put in our hearts towards one another. We ask you to get us through these hard times 
not in a way that makes us further heedless of you and what you call us to, but in a way that guides us to you and guides us to be of use to the world that you have created and vehicles of your mercy and tranquility. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you. thank you so much, Omar and Nancy, for all your good work this week. Again, thank you for tuning in to this conversation weekly. We'll be back again next week and uh, look at for us on our social media posts. Again, we're not asking for contributions to Faith Commons at this time. Please support your religious communities and those nonprofits that are doing such good work. Uh, we, we ask God's blessing upon you. Good day. <laughs>